<laughs> okay, no matter how many times I see that ultimate animation, it is still super cool and yet distracting. Anyway, so what's going on YouTube fam? I'm Sue and welcome to the first of hopefully many how to play guides for Wuthering Waves. This one will be focusing on our girl Yin Lin. She is a surprisingly simple to use yet technical character that rewards you for really understanding the ins and outs of the game's engine. This guide will go over almost everything you can want to know about the character, including her skills, some combos to incorporate into your game plan, what Sonata sets to play on her, echoes, and more. All of this is to help set you up for success with Wuthering Wave's favorite waifu. So without any further ado, let's just get into it. Like most characters, Yinlin's forte circuit, Chameleon Cipher, explains how she works. Her passive is a giant wall of text, but essentially it boils down to just four things. Number one, Yinlin's resident skill allows your attacks to mark enemies with Sinner's Mark. Sinner's Mark deals bonus damage to up to four targets as long as Yinlin is on the field. Number two, Normal attacks build judgment points. Number three, at max judgment points, your heavy attack turns into Chameleon Cipher, which I get it. Chameleon Cipher is the name of the passive and that could be kind of confusing. When I say Chameleon Cipher for the rest of the video, I mean this enhanced heavy attack. And finally, number four, landing Chameleon Cipher turns all Sinner's Marks into Punishment Marks, which persist even when Yinlin isn't in play. Punishment Mark deals roughly four times the amount of damage that a Sinner's Mark does, so the goal should be to get it up as fast as possible and maintain it. Unfortunately, the move that triggers the Mark's Chameleon Cipher has really long end lag. This puts Yinlin in danger of a lot of attacks, especially in the game's hardest content. The trick to protecting Yinlin while she's unable to move is to swap cancel to another ally on her team. This also has the added benefit of allowing the incoming Resonator to get their offense started while Yinlin is unable to move. Once Chameleon Cipher completes, feel free to tag back into Yinlin if you so choose and continue your offense. Swapping out during Yinlin's long animations is the most effective way to get the most out of her passive while still doing the bulk of damage from her skills. Let's break down the rest of her kit now along with its average use cases. Yinlin's resonant skills are her bread and butter. They're what get her offense going. Magnetic Roar deals electro damage in a small radius before putting Yinlin into execution mode for 10 seconds. Execution mode makes Yinlin's normal attacks apply Sinner's Mark. Recall that Sinner's Mark is what we're trying to convert to Punishment Mark off of Chameleon Cipher, so it's important to land at least one normal on your primary targets during this execution mode window. Activating the Resonance skill again during Execution Mode will activate Lightning Execution. Lightning Execution ends Execution Mode early and has Yinlin kick a puppet at her enemy, which after a duration will erupt into a huge AoE attack. Just like with Chameleon Cipher, Yinlin is a sitting duck during this move, so it's best to swap her out with someone who can parry, dodge, or deal damage while she's tied up completing that animation. To recap, Magnetic Roar, land one or more normal attacks on the target, then end your combo with Lightning Execution and swap Yinlin out. This is the core rotation that you should be getting used to. Considering how core they are to marking, I suppose I should probably take some time to talk about Yinlin's normals, which are collectively classified by the game as Zap String's Dance. Like most Resonators, Yinlin's basic attack string has four parts. Attacks 1 and 2 are quick and snappy and really good at parrying enemy attacks. Attack number 3 cannot parry, and also has a decent chunk of end lag that leaves Yinlin exposed. You can mitigate this lag by either dodge canceling the move or just simply swapping out to another teammate. The move will still persist even while Yinlin is not the active character. Attack number four is similar to attack number three. As soon as Yinlin goes for the kick on her puppet, feel free to tag to another teammate and back to Yinlin once the animation completes. Heavy Attack is probably the most universally useful normal on Yinlin. It's an AoE attack, making it great for marking, and it generates the most amount of judgment points of all of her normals. It's also cancelable into almost anything. The only real drawback to this move is that it costs stamina, which may leave you vulnerable. Magnetic Roar into Heavy Attack, followed up by Lightning Execution, is my go-to way to quick mark enemies and get my offense started. Lastly, we have Yinlin's Jump Attack. This move can parry from a really long range, but my experience with it has been very wonky. The best part about the skill is the fact that it's swap cancelable as soon as Yinlin winds up the kick. 
This allows you to go for some really stylish plays off of a grapple or potentially just canceling into it off of an echo skill like Heron. Yinlin's Resonance Liberation is Thundering Wrath. It does AoE damage to enemies in an area, but more importantly than that, leaves Sinner's Marks on all affected targets. You can cancel the end lag of this skill into Chameleon Cipher to quickly convert your new Sinner's Marks into Punishment Marks. This is usually how I end my DPS rotations on Yen Lin. Moving on to the intro skill, it is Raging Storm. This move has the same exact animation as Yenlin's basic attack number 3, meaning that the follow-ups have a lot of end lag that you can swap out of. Generally, I'm canceling this into Magnetic Roar, some kind of Echo skill, or a heavy attack depending where I'm at in my DPS rotation. As an aside, whenever Yinlin enters the field from something that's not her intro skill, she will enter with her basic attack 2 animation. Finally, we come to her outro skill, Strategist. The incoming character has their liberation damage increased by 25% and their electro damage increased by 20% for 14 seconds. As of the time of recording, this basically screams Calcharo, but any character with a strong ultimate can still get a solid boost out of this. Tying up this entire section, here's a basic overview of Yinlin's game plan. Magnetic Roar, mark targets with Zap Strings Dance, then Lightning Execution, and swap out. When she comes back in, if your judgment points are full, land one or two normal attacks, use your Echo skill, then swap back out. Finally, if you swap in and your judgment points are full, ultimate if possible, then go into Chameleon Cipher and swap out. Got it? Good. Now that you understand the character, let's break down how to build her, starting with the weapons. There's no real way for me to avoid this, her 5 star weapon String Master is by far her best option. It provides damage on each of her resident skill usage and whenever she's not on the field, giving a massive damage boost to your Magnetic Roar into Lightning Execution Swap Combo. As of the time of recording, String Master deals I believe roughly 30 to 40% more damage compared to every other option on the character. The other 5 star Rectifier Cosmic Ripples is going to be your next best option. It gives the highest attack percentage and also has some energy regen which is nice, but the basic attack passive is nearly wasted since Yinlin primarily uses her resonant skills and heavy attacks. For 4 star weapons, Augment is the best option because of the critical hit chance main stat, but I recognize it's a battle pass weapon. Jinjo Keeper is your next best 4 star option for those looking to push Yinlin's damage as high as possible. Rectifier of the Night is the best 3 star option since it gives a small attack buff on swap in, which is something we're probably already doing anyways. Let's move on to Sonata Sense. Yinlin's best options are the 5 piece Void Thunder or 5 piece Moonlight Cloud Sense. Void Thunder amps up Yinlin's damage whenever she activates her Lightning Execution swap out combo. Moonlit Clouds is better for those that are looking to supercharge the next incoming character with its passive skill and strategies stacked on top of each other. Overall, both sets give great offensive power to your lineup in different ways, so I suggest using whichever one you have good stats for. For main Echo skills, I like using Impermanence Heron for not only its bonus ultimate charge, but how powerful it is as a swap option. You can swap cancel the initial jump of the bird, which allows you to double up on the Moonlit set and damage buff that it provides. If I'm playing Void Thunder, however, there's quite a bit more options. Both versions of Mephis are solid, and which one you choose is going to be up to you. Tempest Mephis is significantly easier to use and can be swap cancelled after the second hit. Thundering Mephis requires you to be on the field for quite a bit longer, making it a bit harder to use. As a third option, you can consider using the 3 cost Flautus, which builds intro and outro energy. Simply activate the beam and swap cancel a half second into the channel to reap the full benefits. Now, let's talk about echo loadouts and stats. One 4 cost, two 3 cost, and two 1 cost echoes I think is ideal. If you don't have that though and want to just use two 4 costs and three 1 costs until you get better 3 cost echoes, that's fine too. For your 4 cost echo, I recommend critical hit chance percentage as the main stat unless you have Yin's 5 star weapon string master or your echo substats are just really really good overall. In either of these cases, I would recommend going for a critical hit damage main stat. For 3 cost echoes, I found that electro damage percentage is going to be the best but I recognize that you're probably going to be strapped for this if you're farming for Calcharo at the same time. One Electro Damage Percentage and one Energy Regen Percentage could be a solid substitute. As for one cost echoes, Attack Percentage Mainstat is the only thing worth playing in the current state of Wuthering Waves. 
For substat priorities, critical hit chance and critical hit damage are going to be no-brainer pickups, and I try to get them on every single echo if I can. Attack percentage, resonance skill damage, energy regen percentage, and heavy attack damage are also all really solid pickups for the character. Let's wrap up this video with some team building, followed by some fun trivia. As you no doubt know by now, Yinlin is a character that spends just as much time off the field as she does on the field, whether she's your highest damaging character or not. She excels in compositions where there's going to be another strong DPS alongside her. Kalcharo is going to be the best teammate for her since he has a lot of potential swap cancels in his game plan, meaning they can spend equal amounts of time on the field. He just also happens to be electro damaged, which means he could take advantage of her outro skill as well, so yeah, that's why he's the number one choice. If you don't have Kalcharo or just simply don't want to play him, Encore, Havoc Rover, and to a lesser extent, Xion could also work. You want to pick a character that has many swap cancels to tag back into Yin Lin, weaving between the two characters. For example, when you tag out Yin Lin for Jian, he can use his skill into Echo Combo. During the time that Jian is animation locked from the Echo, you can go back into Yin Lin and continue her offense until Jian is ready to go back in. This works with Havoc Rover on the Dreamless Echo as well, and also Encore with her Cloud Frenzy attack. For the final slot in your team, you're going to want a strong support. Verena is the no-brainer best option in my opinion because of how compact her support combo is. She simply comes in, pops a resonant skill and echo, and then swaps out with all of her buffs. This allows you to focus on just doing damage with Yin Lin and the other DPS teammate you've chosen for her. This is really great when you're first learning how to play Yin Lin. You can worry about how she weaves her combos in with the other damage dealer without the burden of having a really complex third character. If you don't have Verena, by the way, Baiju provides a nearly identical gameplay experience, albeit with worse healing and damage buffs. John Shin can also work in this final slot as a suitor bruiser slash healer hybrid. She provides excellent grouping with her liberation, as well as a shield and some healing thanks to her forte circuit. I personally have had a lot of fun and success playing her alongside Yin Lin and another main DPS, but I recognize she's going to be a bit more complicated than just simply slotting Verena onto your team. For a final bit of fun before I close out the video, I like to highlight the voiceover artists who bring the characters in the games I play to life. Voice acting is often overlooked or I find looked down upon by some, and the games that we play, they wouldn't be nearly as great without them. That said, in the English dub of Wuthering Waves, Yinlin is voiced by Naomi McDonald. She is a British comedian who has appeared in games such as Final Fantasy XVI, as well as Elden Ring, and its upcoming expansion this month, Shadow of the Erd Tree. In the Japanese dub of Wuthering Waves, Yinlin is voiced by Koshimizu Ami, who you may have heard as Ryuko Matoi from Kill the Kill, Kalen Stadfeld from Code Geass, or Yukiko Amagi from Persona 4. And that's going to do it for how to play Yin Lin. If I missed anything, as always, you can let me know down in the comment section below. And if you made it this far into the video, thanks for watching. Consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel, and I will see you in the next one. Later now.